derived by this pretty self-explanatory. Um, this title is a little bit narrower than the, our discussion is going to be because the international criminal tribunals in other ways of, in some sense, um, made them why we're healing the wounds of these uh, human rights um, violations. But um, you'll see what, 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 what emerges um, in this discussion. So we're, we, we have a visitor um, from uh, the um, far eastern part of campus, huh. uh, that is to say, uh, the law school. Um, our visitor is Professor Sarah Mohammed, who's been teaching here two years now. Um, uh, she, she comes to us, as, as you'll expect, at a, at a great law school with a brilliant academic record. She went to Guinea, she went to Columbia, and she was a law review, went to the Federal Appeals Court, and all these sort of things that you we expect <laughs> from uh, our, 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 our professors. But that's not the point here. The point here is that she has um, active, uh, hands-on experience with the kind of legal issues that we're talking about. Uh, she was a special advisor. Um, to the uh, International Criminal Court of Darfur, um, which I guess is not on the outline, but it will be in a, in a, in a supplementary outline, which I can just send around, and she may want to uh, talk about. Uh, she was involved in the draft of the U.S. resolution um, against the use of rape as a, as a, um, uh, as a, as a political, as, as a, uh, a political tool. She also has a master in international that she teaches um, these sorts of inter international criminal tribunals um, at, at the law school. So I'm asking her in some sense to press at least a semester, maybe two semesters, and a great deal of experience into um, an hour and 20 minutes of, of, of my asking her questions. Um, I'll see you I'll post an outline, we'll post some more things after, after the discussion. And I think she's welcome um, our usual, our usual uh, format of that. You don't understand something when I ask about something, uh, just raise your hand. So I want to thank you for, for coming. Thank you for having me. So, so I thought we would, I, mean, I know this is very basic, and law students would all know this, but some of us don't. And I, I wanted you to, to, to just explain to us what are these crimes we're talking about? Um, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. Yeah, so when you ask what are the crimes we're talking about when we think about the jurisprudence of human rights, um, it might seem like a simple question. It might seem like something that all law students know, but it's actually a pretty complicated question, and I'd say not all law students know it. Um, so if uh, there are those in the room who already know uh, this list, then that's already a great place to start. Um, so we have the three core crimes. We call them the core crimes of international criminal law, and that's war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Um, and these are the crimes that make up most of what we talk about when we talk about international criminal law. When we talk about war crimes tribunals, we're usually talking about all three of these. Um, but they have something of a varied history. So if we go back to the Nuremberg Tribunals, we think of that as the place where the jurisprudence of human rights really started. But the Nuremberg Tribunal didn't actually deal with these three crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, in these terms. Instead, what they dealt with were crimes against peace, so that's actually something else. That's a crime that we now know as aggression. So I would add a number four to this list, aggression, which is now a crime that's being uh, in, the, it's in the process of being addressed by the International Criminal Court. So aggression is starting an illegal war. What's an illegal war? Good question, all right? This is a question around which there's huge controversy because of concepts like humanitarian war, is a war that is in violation of the basic rules of international law, but it's a war that's meant to protect human rights. Is that an illegal war? Not so clear, and that's why the International Criminal Court has taken so long to figure out how to add that crime of aggression to this list. Now, war crimes was a part of Nuremberg, and crimes against humanity was too. But genocide on its own wasn't actually a crime until a few years later. 
with the drafting of the Genocide Convention in the late 1940s. So what we now know as genocide, so as uh, the killing with a specific intent to kill some particular protected group of people, that was just encompassed in crimes against humanity at that time. So it's only since the 50s or late 40s that we have genocide as a separate crime. So, so I guess the, 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 the next sort of basic question that we want to talk about is, is under what laws are these? So that we all understand, I think, that murder and burglary and all these things are crimes because they're statutes, I assume, didn't, didn't pass the states and but they're all murder. Right, so we, we, have a, we have a pretty mixed bag in what makes these crimes crimes. Um, so some of it actually comes out of the jurisprudence of the Nuremberg Tribunal. And that was then, uh, those laws were then encapsulated in the Nuremberg Principles of 1950. So the Nuremberg Principles are principles. They're not binding law. The Charter of the UN is actually a treaty uh, that governments sign, and so they agree to join the Charter of the UN, just like they could agree to join the Genocide Convention, which might also be added to this list. But not all states have to join the UN if they don't want to. Not all states have to join the Genocide Convention. The Geneva Convention also, those are treaties that states can choose to join or not. So how do we end up then with these courts that are exercising jurisdiction over individuals regardless of whether or not their particular governments have joined that treaty. This is done through something called customary international law. So this is the body of law that exists outside of particular treaties, outside of particular statutes. We would think about it if we thought about it in domestic terms. And these are laws that are supposed to be so ingrained in state practice that we can consider them law as a matter of custom. So the rule against targeting of civilians in wartime, it doesn't matter whether a particular government has signed the Geneva Conventions or not, that is simply a rule by which every government, every individual has to abide. And that's how we end up with this body of law that exists outside the particular treaties. And then apart from all of that, we have courts that are run by statutes, by treaties, that are taking on sort of a life of their own outside of the particular treaty body. So the International Criminal Court is probably the most prominent of these. This is an independent court. It was created out of the UN, but it's not really a UN body. And it's governed by something called the Rome Statute. And the Rome Statute has a list of crimes and has a list of um, jurisdictional um, requirements, so crimes after a certain date, for example, um, the role of the prosecutor in these crimes, um, the role of, uh, or the, the rights of defendants in being charged with these crimes. And the Rome Statute is a treaty that governments can choose to join or not, and the United States government has chosen not to sign on to that treaty. But this doesn't mean that the International Criminal Court can't get its hands on anyone <laughs> Who, who lives in a country that hasn't signed the Rome Statute. And that's because there are other ways for the court to get jurisdiction over individuals. And one of the ways is for the United Nations, in the Security Council of the United Nations, to identify a particular situation and say, this is of concern to us. We want the International Criminal Court to investigate it. And then the International Criminal Court, regardless of whether a state has joined the court or not, the International Criminal Court can still take jurisdiction over that situation. So this is what happened in Sudan a few years ago. Sudan wasn't a party to the court, right? Had no interest in seeing its nationals being tried before an International Criminal Court. And the UN Security Council said, we have a serious situation of war crimes, crimes against humanity, maybe even genocide, going on in Darfur. And we want the court to look at this. And the court did. And now we have prosecutions against soldiers, against political leaders, and against the president. So, does this question, you, you 
we've already begun to talk about these courts, and I want to bring you back to it in a minute. But I, I want to ask you about um, what I call bringing international law home, um, which is a how does national is international jurisprudence relate to national jurisprudence? So remember the last lecture I talked to you about the briefly about the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. Well, that was Israel captured the guy and tried him in, in Israel, and there have been trials like this in France. And then there was, I think, a famous American case, which is international law, um, uh, these international customary laws, you called it, applies nationally. So could you just give us a little brief outline of the relationship between what you just said and what happened in individual nations dealing with people, with, with the, um, these kinds of offenses? Yeah, so the relationship between those national courts and the international ones is a really interesting one and a really complex one and it could take up I think a whole semester uh, if we wanted it to. Um, so I'm going to do it in three minutes. Um, so on, on a broader scale, the International Criminal Court is supposed to be a court that's not taking uh, notice of cases that are already being addressed at the national level. The International Criminal Court is supposed to be a secondary mechanism. Um, so this is a process that's called complementarity. And so the International Criminal Court is supposed to be complementary to national systems of criminal justice, which means the International Criminal Court should only be prosecuting an individual if their home government or if the government, um, say, where victims of this person's crimes live, where some other government is either unable or unwilling to prosecute this individual themselves. So what does that mean? It means that the government's shielding people from prosecution, right? So see Sudan, when the government of Sudan uh, is going to try, or the government of Sudan is not going to try the president of Sudan, right? Because the president of Sudan is running the government still. So that's unwilling. Unable might be a situation where the, where the whole government has just collapsed, where there is no court system that's functioning anymore. Or it might be a less extreme situation where there is a court system, but there's just no law on the books to prosecute what these individuals have done in the way that the International Criminal Court wants to see it being done. So if there's no war crimes provision under national law, what do you do? You have to go to the International Criminal Court. So in the US, we have a whole uh, sort of different system and a unique system for how to think about international law as part of US law. So we have this case that Paquette Habana that says international law is part of our law. So that might be our default position, but it doesn't really mean that in practice because we have some decisions by the United States Supreme Court saying, well, yes, international law is part of our law, but it's secondary in certain ways. So when the US signs a particular treaty, that doesn't automatically mean that individuals, like all of us, can sue the US government to recognize our rights under that treaty. What it means is that the United States has taken on an obligation under international law to do certain things with respect to other governments. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything for US courts. Is a case a long time ago? That was in the 1900s? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still, it's still the case, you know, every, every case that you read about international law in US courts, it's still going to cite this case. And it'll start by saying international law is part of our law, and then it'll say, but, and then give us a long yeah, list of exceptions.